Part two of chapter four of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two of chapter four, second attitude of thought to objectivity. A. The theoretical faculty, cognition qua cognition. The specific ground of the categories is declared by the critical system to lie in the primary identity of the I in thought, what Kant calls the transcendental unity of self-consciousness. The impressions from feeling and perception are, if we look to their contents, a multiplicity of miscellany of elements, and the multiplicity is equally conspicuous in their form, for sense is marked by a mutual exclusion of members, and that under two aspects, namely space and time, which being the forms that is to say the universal type of perception are themselves a priori this congeries afforded by sensation and perception must however be reduced to an identity or primary synthesis to accomplish this the i brings it in relation to itself and unites it there in one consciousness which kant calls pure apperception the specific modes in which the ego refers to itself the multiplicity of senses are the pure concepts of understanding the categories kant it is well known did not put himself to much trouble in discovering the categories i the unity of self-consciousness being quite abstract and completely indeterminate the question arises how are we to get at the specialized form of the i the categories fortunately the common logic offers our hand an empirical classification of the kinds of judgment now to judge is the same as to think of a determinate object hence the various modes of judgment as enumerated to our hand provide us with several categories of thought to the philosophy of fichte belongs the great merit of having called attention to the need of exhibiting the necessity of these categories and giving a genuine deduction of them fichte ought to have produced at least one effect on the method of logic one might have expected that the general laws of thought the usual stock and trade of logicians or the classifications of notions and syllogisms would no longer be taken merely from observation and so only empirically treated but deduced from thought itself if thought is to be capable of proving anything at all if logic must insist on the necessity of proofs and if it proposes to teach the theory of demonstration its first care should be to give a reason for its own subject matter and to see that it is necessary kant therefore holds that the categories have their source in the ego and that the ego consequently supplies the characteristics of universality and necessity if we observe what we have before us primarily we may describe it as a congeries or diversity and in the categories we find the simple points or units to which this congeries is made to converge the world of sense is a scene of mutual exclusion its being is outside itself that is the fundamental feature of the sensible now has no meaning except in reference to a before and a hereafter red in the same way only subsists by being opposed to yellow and blue now this other thing is outside the sensible which latter is only in so far as it is not the other and only in so far as the other is but thought or the ego occupies a position the very reverse of the sensible with its mutual exclusions and being outside itself the i is the primary identity at one with itself and all at home in itself the word i expresses the mere act of bringing to bear upon self and whatever is planned in this unit or focus is affected by it and transformed into it the i is as it were the crucible and the fire which consumes the loose plurality of sense and reduces it to unity this is the process which kant calls pure apperception in distinction from the common apperception to which the plurality it receives is a plurality still whereas pure apperception is rather an act by which the eye makes the materials mine this view has at least the merit of giving correct expression to the nature of all consciousness the tendency of all men's endeavours is to understand the world to appropriate and subdue it to himself and to this end the positive reality of the world must be as it were crushed and pounded in other words idealised at the same time we must note that it is not the mere act of our personal self-consciousness which introduces an absolute unity into the variety of sense rather this identity is itself absolute the absolute is as it were so kind as to leave individual things to their own enjoyment and it again drives them back to the absolute unity expressions like the transcendental unity of self-consciousness have an ugly look about them and suggest a monster in the background but their meaning is not so abstruse as it looks 
Kant's meaning of transcendental may be gathered by the way he distinguishes it from transcendent. The transcendent may be said to be what stops out beyond the categories of the understanding, a sense in which the term is first employed in mathematics. Thus, in geometry, you are told to conceive the circumference of a circle as formed of an infinite number of infinitely small straight lines, in other words, characteristics which understanding holds to be totally different. The straight line and the curve are expressly invested with identity. Another transcendent of the same kind is the self-consciousness when it is identical with itself and infinite in itself as distinguished from the ordinary consciousness which derives its form and tone from finite materials that unity of self-consciousness however kant calls transcendental only and he meant thereby that the unity was only in our minds and did not attach to objects apart from our knowledge of them to regard the categories as subjective only i e as a part of ourselves must seem very odd to the natural mind and no doubt there is something queer about it it is quite true however that the categories are not contained in the sensation as it is given us when for instance we look at a piece of sugar we find it hard white sweet etc all of these properties we say are united in one object now it is this unity that is not found in the sensation the same thing happens if we conceive two events to stand in relation of cause and effect the senses only inform us of the two several occurrences which follow each other in time but that the one is the cause the other the effect in other words the causal nexus between the two is not perceived by sense it is only evident to thought still though the categories such as unity or cause and effect are strictly the property of thought it by no means follows that they must be ours merely and not characteristics of the object kant however confines them to the subject mind and his philosophy may be styled subjective idealism for he holds that both the form and the matter of knowledge are supplied by the ego or knowing subject the form by our intellectual the matter by our sentient ego so regards the content of this subjective idealism not a word need be wasted it might perhaps at first sight be imagined that objects would lose their reality when their unity was transferred to the subject but neither we nor the objects would have anything to gain by the mere fact that they possessed being the main point is not that they are but what they are and whether or not their content is true it is no good to the things to say merely that they have being what has being will also cease to be when time creeps over it it might also be alleged that subjective idealism tended to promote self-conceit but surely if a man's world be the sum of his sensible perceptions he has no reason to be vain of such a world laying aside therefore as unimportant this distinction between subjective and objective we are chiefly interested in knowing what a thing is i e its content which is no more objective than it is subjective if mere existence be enough to make objectivity even a crime is objective but it is an existence which is nullity at its core as is definitely made apparent when the day of punishment comes the categories may be viewed in two aspects on the one hand it is by their instrumentality that the mere perception of sense rises to objectivity in experience on the other hand these notions are unities in our consciousness merely they are consequently conditioned by the material given to them and having nothing of their own they can be applied to use only within the range of experience but the other constituent of experience the impressions of feeling and perception is not one whit less subjective than the categories to assert the categories taken by themselves are empty can scarcely be right seeing that they have a content at all events in the special stamp and significance which they possess of course the content of the categories is not perceptible to the senses nor is it in time and space but that is rather a merit than a defect a glimpse of this meaning of content may be observed to affect our ordinary thinking a book or a speech for example is said to have a great deal in it to be full of content in proportion to the greater number of thoughts and general results to be found in it whilst on the contrary we should never say that any book for example a novel had much in it because it included a great number of single incidents situations and the like even the popular voice thus recognises that something more than the facts of sense is needed to make a work pregnant with the matter and what is this additional desideratum but thoughts or in the first instance the categories and yet it is not altogether wrong it should be added to call the categories of themselves empty if it be meant that they and the logical idea of which they are the members do not constitute the whole of philosophy but necessarily lead onwards in due progress to the real departments of nature and mind only let the progress not be misunderstood the logical idea does not thereby come into possession of a content originally foreign to it but by its own native action is specialised and 
developed to nature and mind. It follows that the categories are no fit terms to express the absolute, the absolute not being given in perception. And understanding or knowledge by means of the categories is consequently incapable of knowing the things in themselves. The thing in itself, and under thing is embraced even mind and God, expresses the object when we leave out of sight all consciousness makes of it, all of its emotional aspects and specific thoughts of it. It is easy to see what is left, utter abstraction, total emptiness only described still as an other world, the negative of every image feeling in definite thought. Nor does it require much penetration to see that this caput mortem is still only a product of thought, such as accrues when thought is carried to abstraction unalloyed that it is work of the empty ego which makes an object out of this empty self-identity of its own the negative characteristic which this abstract identity receives as an object is also enumerated among the categories of kant and is no less familiar than the empty identity aforesaid hence one can only read with surprise this perceptual remark that we do not know the thing in itself on the contrary there is nothing we can know so easily it is reason the faculty of the unconditioned which discovers the conditioned nature of the knowledge compromised in experience what is thus called the object of reason the infinite or unconditioned is nothing but the self-sameness or primary identity of the ego and thought reason itself is the name given to the abstract ego or thought which makes this pure identity its aim or object now this identity having no definite attribute at all can receive no illumination from the truths of experience for the reason that these refer always to definite facts such is the sort of unconditioned that is supposed to be the absolute truth of reason what is termed idea whilst the cognitions of experience are reduced to the level of untruth and declared to be appearances kant was the first definitely to signalise the distinction between reason and understanding the object of the former as he applied the term was the infinite and unconditioned of the latter the finite and conditioned kant did valuable service when he enforced the finite character of the cognitions of the understanding founded merely upon experience and stamped their contents with the name of appearance but his mistake was to stop at the purely negative point of view and to limit the unconditionality of reason to an abstract self-sameness without any shade of distinction it degrades reason to a finite and conditioned thing to identify it with a mere stepping beyond the finite and conditioned range of understanding the real infinite far from being a mere transcendence of the finite always involves the absorption of the finite into its own fuller nature in the same way kant restored the idea to its proper dignity vindicating it for reason as a thing distinct from the abstract analytic determinations or from the merely sensible conceptions which usually appropriate to themselves the name of ideas but as respects to the idea also he never got beyond its negative aspect as what ought to be but is not the view that objects of immediate consciousness which constitute the body of experience are mere appearances phenomena was another important result of the kantian philosophy common sense that mixture of sense and understanding believes the objects of which it has knowledge to be severally independent and self-supporting and when it becomes evident that they tend towards and limit one another the interdependence of one upon another is reckoned something foreign to them and to their true nature the very opposite is the truth the things immediately known are mere appearances in other words the ground of their being is not in themselves but in something else but then comes the important step of defining what this something else is according to kant the things that we know about are to us appearances only and we can never know their essential nature which belongs to another world we cannot approach plain minds have not unreasonably taken exception to this subjective idealism with the reduction of the facts of consciousness to a purely personal world created by ourselves alone for the true statement of the case is rather as follows the things of which we have direct consciousness are mere phenomena not for us only but in their own nature and the true and proper case of these things finite as they are is to have their existence founded not in themselves but in the universal divine idea this view of things it is true is as idealist as kant's but its contradiction to the subjective idealism of the critical philosophy should be termed absolute idealism absolute idealism however though it is far advanced of vulgar realism is by no means merely restricted to philosophy it lies at the root of all religion for religion too believes the actual world we see the sum total of existence to be created and governed by god but it is not enough to simply indicate the existence of the object of reason curiosity impels us to seek for knowledge of this identity this empty thing in itself 
but knowledge means such an acquaintance with the object as apprehends its distinct and special subject matter but such subject matter involves a complex inner connection in the object itself and supplies a ground of connection with many other objects in the present case to express the nature of the features of the infinite or thing in itself reason would have nothing except the categories and in any endeavour so to employ them reason becomes oversoaring or transcendent here begins the second stage of the criticism of reason which as an independent piece of work is more valuable than the first the first part as has been explained above teaches that categories originate in the unity of self-consciousness that any knowledge which is gained by their means has nothing objective in it and that the very objectivity claimed for them is only subjective so far as this goes the kantian criticism presents the common type of idealism known as subjective idealism it asks no questions about the meaning or scope of the categories but simply considers the abstract form of subjectivity and objectivity and that even in such a partial way that the former aspect that of subjectivity is retained as a final and purely affirmative term of thought in the second part however when kant examines the application as it is called which reason makes of the categories in order to know its object the content of the categories at least in some points of view comes in for discussion or at any rate an opportunity presented itself for a discussion of the question it is worth while to see what decision kant arrives at on the subject of metaphysics as this application of the categories to the unconditioned is called his method of procedure we shall here briefly state and criticize the first of the unconditioned entities which kant examines is the soul in my consciousness he says quote, i always find that i am the determining subject Subject, am singular or abstractly simple am identical or one and the same in all the variety of what i am conscious of distinguish myself as thinking from all things outside of me End quote. now the method of the old metaphysic as kant correctly states consisted in substituting for these statements of experience the corresponding categories or metaphysical terms thus arise these four new propositions a the soul is a substance b it is a simple substance c it is numerically identical at various periods of existence d it stands in relation to space kant discusses this translation and draws attention to the paralogism or mistake of confounding one kind of truth with another he points out that empirical attributes have been replaced by categories and shows that we are not entitled to argue from the former to the latter or to put the latter in place of the former this criticism obviously but repeats the observation of hume that the categories as a whole ideas of universality and necessity are entirely absent from sensation and that the empirical fact both in form and contents differ from its intellectual formulation if the purely empirical fact were held to constitute the credentials of thought then no doubt it would be indispensable to be able to precisely identify the idea in the impression and in order to make out in his criticism the metaphysical psychology that the soul cannot be described as substantial simple self-same and as maintaining its independence in the intercourse with the material world kant argues from the single ground that the several attributes of the soul which consciousness lets us feel in experience are not exactly the same attributes as the result from the action of thought thereon but we have seen above that according to kant all knowledge even experience consists in thinking our impressions in other words in transforming into intellectual categories the attributes primary belonging to sensation unquestionably one good result of the kantian criticism was that it emancipated mental philosophy from the sole thing from the categories and consequently from questions about the simplicity complexity materiality etc of the soul even for the common sense of ordinary man the true point of view from which the inadmissibility of these forms best appears will be not that they are thoughts but that thoughts of such a stamp neither can nor do contain truth if thought and phenomenon do not perfectly correspond to one another we are free at least to choose which of the two shall be held the defaulter the kantian idealism where it touches on the world of reason throws the blame on the thoughts saying that the thoughts are defective and not being exactly fitted to the sensations and to the mode of mind wholly restricted within the range of sensation in which as such there are no traces of the presence of these thoughts but as the actual content of thought no question is raised paralogisms are a species of unsound syllogism the especial vice of which consists in employing one and the same word in two premises with a different meaning 
And according to Kant, the method adopted by the rational psychology of the old metaphysics, when they assumed that the qualities of the phenomenal soul, as given in experience, formed part of its own real essence, was based upon such a paralogism. Nor can it be denied that predicates like simplicity, performance, etc., are inapplicable to the soul. But their unfitness is not due to the ground assigned by Kant that reason by applying them would exceed its appointed bounds the true ground is that this style of abstract terms is not good enough for the soul which is very much more than a mere simple or unchangeable sort of thing and thus for example while the soul may be admitted to be simple self-sameness it is at the same time active and institutes distinctions in its own nature but whatever is merely or abstractly simple is as such also a mere dead thing by his polemic against the metaphysic of the past kant discarded the predicates of the soul or mind he did well but when he came to state his reasons his failure is apparent the second unconditioned object is the world in the attempt which reason makes to comprehend the unconditioned nature of the world it falls into what are called antinomies in other words it maintains two opposite propositions about the same object and in such a way that each of them has to be maintained with equal necessity for this it follows that the body of cosmical fact the specific statements descriptive of which run into contradictions cannot be the self-subsistent reality but only in appearance the explanation offered by kant alleges that the contradiction does not affect the object in its own proper essence but attaches only to the reason which seeks to comprehend it in this way the suggestion was broached that the contradiction is occasioned by the subject matter itself or by the intrinsic quality of the categories and to offer the idea that the contradiction introduced into the world of reason by the categories of understanding is inevitable and essential was to make one of the most important steps in the progress of modern philosophy but the more important the issue thus raised the more trivial was its solution its only motive was an excess of tenderness for things of the world the blemish of contradiction it seems could not be allowed to mar the essence of the world but there could be no objection to attach to thinking reason to the essence of mind probably nobody will feel disposed to deny that the phenomenal world presents contradictions to the observing mind meaning by phenomenal the world as it presents itself to the senses and understanding to the subjective mind but if a comparison is instituted between the essence of the world and the essence of the mind it does seem strange to hear how calmly and confidently the modest dogma has been advanced by one and repeated by others that thought or reason not the world is the seat of contradiction it is no escape to turn round and explain that reason falls into contradiction only by applying the categories for this application of the categories is maintained to be necessary and reason is not supposed to be equipped with any other forms but the categories for the purpose of cognition but cognition is determining and determinate thinking so if reason be a mere empty indeterminate thinking it thinks nothing and if in the end reason be reduced to mere identity without diversity it will in the end also win a happy release from contradiction at the slight sacrifice of all its facts and contents it may also be noted that his failure to make a more thorough study of antinomony was one of the reasons why kant enumerated only four antinomonies these four attracted his notice because as may be seen in his discussion of the so-called paralogisms of reason he assumed the list of the categories as a basis of his argument employing what has subsequently become a favourite fashion he simply put the object under a rubric otherwise ready to hand instead of deducing its characteristics from its notion further deficiencies in the treatment of the antinomonies i have pointed out as occasion offered in my science of logic here it will be sufficient to say that the antinomonies are not confined to the four special objects objects taken from the cosmology they appear in all objects of every kind in all conceptions notions and ideas to be aware of this and to know objects in this property of theirs makes a vital part in a philosophical theory for the property thus indicated is what we shall afterwards describe as the dialectical influence in logic the principles of the metaphysical philosophy gave rise to the belief that when cognition lapsed into contradictions it was mere accidental aberration due to some subjective mistake in argument and inference according to kant however thought has a natural tendency to issue in contradictions or antinomonies whenever it seeks to apprehend the infinite we have in the latter part of the above paragraph referred to the philosophical importance of the antinomonies of reason and show how the recognition of their existence helped largely to get rid of the rigid dogmatism of the metaphysics of understanding and to direct attention to the dialectical movement of thought but here too kant as we must add never got beyond the negative result that the thing in itself is unknowable and never penetrated to the discovery of what the antinomonies really and positively mean 
and that true and positive meaning of the antinomies is this that every actual thing involves a coexistence of opposed elements consequently to know or in other words to comprehend an object is equivalent to being conscious of it as a concrete unity of opposed determinations the old metaphysic as we have already seen when it studied the objects of which it sought a metaphysical knowledge went to work by applying categories abstractly and to the exclusion of their opposites kant on the other hand tried to prove that the statements issuing through this method could be met by other statements of contrary import with equal warrant and equal necessity in the enumeration of these antinomies he narrowed his ground to the cosmology of the old metaphysical system and in his discussion made out four antinomies a number which rests upon the list of the categories the first antinomy is on the question whether we are or are not to think the world limited in space and time in the second antinomy we have a discussion of the dilemma matter must be conceived either as endlessly divisible or as consisting of atoms the third antinomy bears upon the antithesis of freedom and necessity to such extent as it embraced in the question whether everything in the world must be supposed subject to the condition of causality or if we can also assume free beings in other words absolute initial points of action in the world finally the fourth antinomy is the dilemma either the world as a whole has a cause or it is uncaused the method which kant follows in discussing these antinomies is as follows he puts the two propositions implied in the dilemma over against each other as thesis and antithesis and seeks to prove both that is to say he tries to exhibit them as inevitably issuing from reflection on the question he particularly protests against the charge of being a special pleader and of grounding his reason on illusions speaking honestly however the arguments which kant offers for his thesis and antithesis are mere shams of demonstration the thing to be proved is invariably implied in the assumption he starts from and the speciousness of his proofs is only due to his prolix and apagogic mode of procedure yet it was and still is a great achievement for the critical philosophy and when it exhibited these antinomies for in this way it gave some expression at first certainly subjective and unexplained to the actual unity of those categories which are kept persistently separate by understanding the first of the cosmological antinomies for example implies a recognition of the doctrine that space and time present a discrete as well as a continuous aspect whereas the old metaphysic laying exclusive emphasis on the continuity have been led to treat the world as unlimited in space and time but it is no less correct that space and time are real and actual only when they are defined or specialized into here and now a specialization which is involved in the very notion of them the same observations apply to the rest of the antinomies take for example the antimony of freedom and necessity the main gist of it is that freedom and necessity as understood by abstract thinkers are not independently real as these thinkers suppose but merely ideal factors moments of true freedom and the true necessity and that to abstract and isolate either conception is to make it false the third object of the reason is god he also must be known and defined in terms of thought but in comparison with the unalloyed identity every defining term as such seems to the understanding to be only a limit and a negation every reality accordingly must be taken as limitless i e undefined accordingly god when he is defined to be the sum of all realities the most real of beings turns into a mere abstract and the only term under which the most real of real things can be defined is that of being itself the height of abstraction these are two elements abstract identity on one hand which is spoken of in this place as the notion and being on the other which reason seeks to unify and their union is the ideal of reason to carry out this unification two ways or two forms are admissible either we may begin with being and proceed to the abstractum of thought or the movement may begin with the abstraction and end in being we shall in the first place start from being but being in its natural aspect presents itself to view as a being of infinite variety a world in all its plentitude and this world may be regarded in two ways first as a collection of innumerable unconnected facts and second as a collection of innumerable facts in mutual relation giving evidence of design the first aspect is emphasized in the cosmological proof the latter in the proofs of natural theology suppose now that this fullness of being passes under the agency of thought then it is stripped of its isolation and unconnectedness and viewed as a universal and absolutely necessary being which determines itself and acts by general purposes or laws and this necessary and self-determined being different from the being at the commencement is god the main force of kant's criticism on this process attacks it for being syllogizing i e transition perceptions and the aggregate of perceptions 
we call the world exhibit as they stand no traces of the universality which they afterwards receive from the purifying act of thought the empirical conception of the world therefore gives no warrant for the idea of universality and so any attempt on the part of thought to ascend from the empirical conception of the world of god is checked by the argument of hume according to which we have no right to think sensations that is to elicit universality and necessity from them man is essentially a thinker and therefore sound common sense as well as philosophy will not yield up their right of rising to god from and out of the empirical view of the world the only basis on which this rise is possible is the thinking study of the world not the bare sensuous animal attuition of it thought and thought alone has eyes for the essence substance universal power and ultimate design of the world and what men call the proofs of god's existence are rightly understood ways of describing and analysing the native course of the mind the course of thought thinking the data of the senses the rise of thought beyond the world of sense its passage from the finite to the infinite the leap into the supersensible which it takes when it snaps asunder the chain of sense all this transition is thought and nothing but thought say there must be no such passage and you say there is no thinking and in sooth animals make no such transition they never get further than sensation and the perception of the senses and in consequence they have no religion both on general grounds and in the particular case there are two remarks to be made upon the criticism of this exaltation in thought the first remark deals with the question of form when the exaltation is exhibited in syllogistic process in the shape of what we call proofs of the being of god these reasons cannot but start from some sort of theory of the world which makes it an aggregate of either contingent facts or the final causes and relations involving design the merely syllogistic thinker may deem the starting point a solid basis and suppose that it remains throughout in the same empirical light left at last as it was at first in this case the bearing of the beginning upon the conclusion to which it leads has a purely affirmative aspect as if we were only reasoning from one thing which is and continues to be to another thing which in like manner is but the great error is to restrict our notions of the nature of thought to its form and understanding alone to think the phenomenal world rather means to recast its form and transmute it into a universal and thus the action of thought has also a negative effect upon its basis the matter of sensation when it receives the stamp of universality at once loses its first and phenomenal shape by the removal and negation of the shell the kernel within the sense percept is brought to the light and it is because they do not with sufficient prominence express the negative features implied in the exaltation of the mind from the world to god that the metaphysical proofs of the being of god are defective interpretations and descriptions of the process if the world is only a sum of incidents it follows that it is also deciduous and phenomenal in esse and posse no that upward spring of the mind signifies that the being which the world has is only a substance no real being no absolute truth it signifies that beyond and above that appearance truth abides in god so that true being is another name for god the process of exaltation might thus appear to be a transition and to involve a means but it is not a whit less true and every trace of transition and means is absorbed since the world which might have seemed to be the means of reaching god is explained to be a nullity unless the being of the world is nullified the point d'appui for the exaltation is lost in this way the apparent means vanishes and the process of derivation is cancelled in the very act by which it proceeds it is the affirmative aspect of this relation as supposed to subsist between two things either of which is as much as the other which jacobi mainly has his eye when he attacks the demonstration of the understanding justly censoring them for seeking conditions i e the world for the unconditioned he remarks that the infinite or god must on such a method be presented as dependent and derivative but that elevation as it takes place in the mind serves to correct the semblance in fact it has no other meaning than to correct that semblance jacobi however failed to recognise the genuine nature of essential thought by which it cancels the mediation in the very act of mediating and consequently his objection though it tells against the mere reflective understanding is false when applied to thought as a whole and in particular to reasonable thought to explain what we mean by the neglect of the negative factor in thought we may refer by way of illustration to the charges of pantheism and atheism brought against the doctrines of spinoza the absolute substance of spinoza certainly falls short of absolute spirit and it is a right and proper requirement that god should be defined as absolute spirit but when the definition in spinoza is said to identify the world with god and to confound god with nature and the finite world it is implied that the finite world possesses a genuine actuality and affirmative reality 
if this assumption be admitted of course the union of god with the world renders god completely finite and degrades him to the bare finite and adventitious congeries of existence but there are two objections to be noted in the first place spinoza does not define god as the unity of god with the world but as the union of thought with extension that is with the material world and secondly even if we accept this awkward popular statement as to this unity it would still be true that the system of spinoza was not atheism but a cosmism defining the world to be an appearance lacking in the true reality a philosophy which affirms that god and god alone is should not be stigmatised as atheistic when even those notions which worship the ape the cow or the images of stone and brass are credited with some religion but as things stand the imagination of ordinary men feels a vehement reluctance to surrender its dearest conviction that this aggregate of finitude which it calls world has actual reality and to hold that there is no world is a way of thinking they are fain to believe impossible or at least much less possible than to entertain the idea that there is no god human nature not much to its credit is more ready to believe that a system denies god than that it denies the world a denial of god seems so much more intelligible than a denial of the world the second remark bears on the criticism of the material propositions to which the elevation in thought in the first instance leads if the propositions have for their predicate such terms as substance of the world its necessary essence cause which regulates and directs it according to design they are certainly inadequate to express what is or ought to be understood by god yet apart from the trick of adopting a preliminary popular conception of god and criticising a result of this assumed standard it is certain that these characteristics have great value and are necessary factors in the idea of god but if we wish in this way to bring before thought the genuine idea of god and give its true value and expression to the central truth we must be careful not to start from a subordinate level of facts to speak of the merely contingent things of the world is a very inadequate description of the premises the organic structures and the evidence they afford of mutual adaptation belong to a higher province the province of animated nature but even without taking into consideration the possible blemish which the study of animated nature and the other teleological aspects of existing things may contract from the pettiness of the final causes and from the puerile instances of them and their bearings merely animated nature is at best incapable of supplying the material for a truthful expression of the idea of god god is more than life he is spirit and therefore if the thought of absolute takes a starting point for its rise and desires to take the nearest the most true and the adequate starting point will be found in the nature of spirit alone the other way of unification by which to realise the ideal of reason is to set out from the abstractum of thought and seek to characterise it for which purpose being is the only available term this is the method of the ontological proof the opposition here presented from a merely subjective point of view lies between thought and being whereas in the first way of junction being is common to the two sides of the antithesis and the contrast lies only between its individualization and universality understanding meets the second way with what is implicitly the same objection as it made to the first it denied that the empirical involves the universal so it denies that the universal involves the specialization which specialization in this instance is being in other words it says being cannot be deduced from the notion by any analysis this uniformly favourable reception and acceptance which attended kant's criticism of the ontological proof was undoubtedly due to the illustration which he made use of to explain the differences between thought and being he took the instance of a hundred sovereigns which for anything it matters to the notion are the same hundred whether they are real or only possible though the difference of the two cases is very perceptible to their effect on a man's purse nothing can be more obvious than that anything we only think or conceive is not on that account actual that mental representation and even notional comprehension always falls short of being still it may not unfairly be styled a barbarism in language when the name notion is given to things like a hundred sovereigns and putting that mistake aside those who perpetually urge against the philosophic idea the difference between being and thought might have admitted that philosophers were not wholly ignorant of the fact can there be any proposition more trite than this but after all it is well to remember when we speak of god that we have an object of another kind than any hundred sovereigns and unlike any one particular notion representation or however else it may be styled it is in fact this and this alone which marks everything finite its being in time and space is discrepant from its notion god on the contrary expressly has to be what can only be thought as existing his notion involves being it is this unity of the notion and being that constitutes the notion of god if this were all we should have only a formal expression of the divine nature which would not really go beyond a statement of the nature of the notion itself for that the notion in its most abstract terms involves being as plain 
for the notion whatever other determination it may receive is at least reference back on itself which results by abolishing the intermediation and thus is immediate and what is that reference to self but being certainly it would be strange if the notion the very inmost of mind if even the ego or above all the concrete totality we call god were not rich enough to include so poor a category as being the very poorest and most abstract of all if we look at the thought nothing can be more insignificant than being and yet there may be something still more insignificant than being that which at first sight is perhaps supposed to be an external and sensible existence like that of the paper lying before me however in this matter nobody proposes to speak of the sensible existence of a limited and perishable thing besides the petty stricture of the critique that thought and being are different can at most molest the path of the human mind from the thought of god to certainty that he is it cannot take it away it is this process of transition depending on the absolute inseparability of the thought of god from his being for which its proper authority has been revindicated in the theory of faith or immediate knowledge whereof hereafter in this way thought at its highest pitch has to go outside for any determinateness and although it is continually termed reason is out and out abstract thinking and the result of all is that reason supplies nothing beyond the formal unity required to simplify and systematize experience it is a canon not an organon of truth and can furnish only a criticism of knowledge not a doctrine of the infinite in its final analysis this criticism is summed up in the assertion that in strictness thought is only the indeterminate unity and the action of this indeterminate unity kant undoubtedly held reason to be the faculty of the unconditioned but if reason be reduced to abstract identity only it by implication renounces its unconditionality and is in reality no better than empty understanding for reason is unconditioned only in so far as its character and quality are not due to an extraneous or foreign content only in so far as it is self-characterising and thus in point of content is its own master kant however expressly explains that the action of reason consists solely in applying the categories to systematise the matter given by perception i e to place it in an outside order under the guidance of the principle of non-contradiction end of part two of chapter four recording by ryan smallwood